it looks like we have quorum, a uh, much fuller house than expected, actually, on the eve of Labor Day weekend. So I think we can call the meeting to order. And <clears throat> Need a motion to do that, or just we can no. just call it order. Okay, great. You can do it. <laughs> and so the next item on our agenda is approval of the meeting the meeting minutes for July seventeenth. We have any amendments, corrections, or issues with those minutes? Can I have a motion? Then make a motion to right. accept the minutes. Second. As okay. Great. All right, and then the third item. Better vote. I think any other. Okay, we've got a vote. Thank you. All in favor? Uh, <laughs> any opposed? Oh. Any abstentions? Kale is opposing. I think he's. he's yeah, no. <laughs> <I'm> a... <clears throat> sorry, sorry, guys. I my, my meeting in Boston went a little longer than expected, and now I've been sitting in traffic for an hour, so it's a ton of fun. Uh, okay. I was I was not there for the seventeenth, so I have to abstain. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, and now I think we move to a membership update, which I believe we officially have a, a new member. Yes, I, was, <laughs> I, um, I feel I completed my application with the town. Town clerk swore me in, so we'll sit on this. Well, welcome. Thank uh, you. We're excited to have you here, and uh, I know you'll be a great addition to this committee. All right, moving right along. Oh, yeah. Maybe one more yeah. member that's going to be oh, okay. joining. Um, uh, I believe her name is Kate. I'm misremembered. Mis she uh, is a, a staff person with the Concord Museum. That's right. So we're trying to beef up our arts and culture representation. So uh, uh, I know she got her volunteer card in and we're hoping for her to get appointed. Yeah, it's going to be exciting. Okay, and now we will move into our discussion of wastewater issues. Welcome. Um, do we want to do introductions? Oh, yes, please. Let's do that um, do, for the entire committee. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I will go. My name is Tiffany Obchinski. I'm relatively new to this committee. I think I've been on it about six months. I um, have lived in Concord for two years, and um, before that, lived in the Bay Area for about 30 years. So I'm still acclimating to life around here, but very much enjoying it. Can you explain sort of the connection? I'm still learning about the committee. Yes. This is helpful for me because I'm, you know, I'm still, uh, I forgot it was a committee. I thought it was sort of a larger group. I'm confused with business partnership, which is a large audience, but your background and kind of why you're on the committee? Yes, Curious. absolutely. So when I um, worked, when I lived in San Francisco and um, much of my professional roles have been guiding cities on public policy, especially as it usually relates to tech and tech's impact on development, that um, I haven't seen that be as critical an issue per se in Concord, but in the Bay Area and in Southern California and some of the global offices where we did work um, that was an issue. So the impact of business on a community and vice versa has always been of interest to me. And so seeing how the community of Concord continues to grow and thrive from an economic perspective, um, especially as it pertains to its um, business communities of interest, in me, of interest to me. So that is my connection. And I am a community member, not a business owner. So it okay. is from that yeah. vantage so point. How are you aware of the charge? Um, so we want to just talk about the, the charge. If, if you guys don't mind, this is helpful. And I will, you know, this is obviously an important committee for me to be familiar with as far as director of public works, just when, when in, it's appropriate to you know, check in and obviously working with Mimi, she's keeping an ear open for those things that she realizes that might be good for this committee, but I'm always interested to know who are the, you know, stakeholders and, you know, who's got a voice and, you know, where do we go and when, so that's kind of, so it's hard to be kind of. Well, I think this, this committee, economic vitality has to do with the business community more so than the residential community. By the way, if we continue, I'm Greg Higgins, been in town most of my life, and um, I'm a member at large. Mike Lawson asked me to be on, but I don't know why. <laughs> um, <laughs> he didn't tell. <laughs> but I, I think this committee is um, to sort of represent the interests of, of land owners, you know, commercial property owners and businesses and helping them 
helping the town relate to them and work with them. So the, a committee that helps Mimi do her function, which she followed the committee, I guess the select board felt they had to create the committee and then hire staff for the committee. I don't mean that she's staff of us, but no, no, right, no, I'm sure. We're, yeah. we're kissing cousins in terms of what our functional well, support for, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there are four pillars that Mike has designed for the committee to help guide us, and those pillars are recruiting and retaining businesses. So, trying to tap into how do we get new businesses to fill vacancies? What can we do to help businesses stay and thrive here? Mm -hmm. We have a pillar devoted to policy and what policies are impacting businesses and where the committee can come forward and support various groups and articles that help continue to open doors for businesses. Um, I believe marketing and promotion is another mm -hmm. pillar that we have as part of the committee. So how can we help businesses via events? promote what they're, you know, what they're doing and how we get foot traffic to those areas, as well as if you're an incoming business, what can we do to promote the opportunities here as well to make that journey a bit easier? Right. Um, that's, that's helpful. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Uh, I'm Steve Barrow, a lifelong resident of Concord, retired dairy farmer, uh, <laughs> now uh, uh, specializing in vegetables and prepared meals and things. And uh, I'd like to just grab a minute on the floor with, before we get into other things. Um, as long as I've lived in town, we've had no people coming in town. The population is much smaller. When I first no numbers, I think around 8,000 or so. <laughs> and uh, Everybody that comes in is glad they came, but they want to slam the door so nobody else can come in. They don't want it to grow too much. And I realized we have a problem with the uh, sewer plant that there are all kinds of capacity and uh, trying to figure ways to make it work and absorb more volume. Right in is some issues, I believe, with the state and some of their regulations. And so that's their agenda, and they've, uh, I think part of their policy has been to make it less attractive, I'll say, for new business to come in and join the sewer system. And then as a member of the Economic Vitality Committee, uh, we're supposed to promote new businesses and make them grow. So here we are. Uh, Mark Martinez. So the inside jokes is that, uh, so my family used to be in the dairy business. So Steve and, and my yeah, my father and Steve have been working together. But they a lot of times. Well, but... <laughs> um, so uh, in, in the community? Yeah, yeah. So we had a dairy in Bedford and we used to pick oh, up okay. surrounding milk and interesting. And, uh, so yeah. we've known each other for a long time. Uh, I really appreciate it. My business manager delivered milk. I don't know for who, but that's what he did as a kid. So yeah, <laughs> small world. Good credentials. A lot of people get to do that. Um, so uh, my family. So I've lived in town pretty much my whole life. Uh, we own a building in town and have been in real estate management for the last forty years. Um, more recently, I've developed other properties in other towns, and I've seen certain perspectives mm -hmm. um, from those other towns. I also uh, am a member of the. Business partnerships sit on their board as well as Steve and Greg. Uh, so, you know, if you think about how the the EBC came to be and what it's done, it, it was, you know, sort of the, the the energy was really during COVID as far as outdoor dining, parking, pushing those business interests, and you know, sort of advising the select board as well as informing the town managers to some of the needs. Mm -hmm. So, I think the last couple last few years, it's been you know, cell phone service, parking. Uh, downtown issues, whatever, what, what have you. Uh, so we're sort of proving if he always comes up, um, you know, how to fill dark spaces, how to think about how to bring more business to Concord. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really the, so our, our avenue is really to advise the select board so they're, they keep their business hat on. Yeah. Because for a number of years, you know, didn't seem like people were really thinking of biz about businesses. And mm -hmm. so, you know, Mimi's uh, role has been hugely helpful. You know, Megan's hires is important. So it's really trying to build that gateway to make sure that we're, we're really standing behind the notion of making the three business districts sort of healthy and robust and, and to grow. Mm -hmm. So 
Yeah. Well, I'm Giovanni Caceres, and I've been in the town of Concord for two years now. So, what I'm so engineer, um, I'm very involved with the wastewater treatment plan and process. I'm um, one of my responsibilities. So, Alan asked me to come and come along and have to hear your conversations and discussions. Interestingly enough, we picked uh, Giovanni up from DOC. Yeah, he was on the outside of the wall, not inside. <laughs> Uh, but did a lot of engineering with uh, Department of Correction. Very familiar with MCI. Mm -hmm. Interesting, you know. Didn't anticipate or plan this, but it, it will come into yeah, play. Talk. I'm Alan Kaffer. I'm the director of Public Works. Uh, I've been working for the town of Concord for 28 years. So I'm a newbie, according to Steve. Uh, <laughs> but when I first arrived, uh, I think Greg was on the Public Works Commission, and I got to, you know, kind of helped me understand how Concord ticks, um, Steve as well. Um, just a, I'm just a farmer routine, I love that one. <laughs> With engineering pedigrees and whatnot, but uh, Steve has good experience as far as on a larger scale wastewater that's not municipal, you know, just dealing with the challenges of, you know, what it takes to run a business. Um, I'll leave it at that, but I was water sewer for you know, 23 years in the last four or five I've been public works director, so. I'm Glenn Rolla Mackey. I own uh, the Concord Funeral Home on Thoreau Street, down up in Thoreau, for 20 years, but 16 of the 20 years I've been active at the Chamber of Commerce. And my main function here is to be a liaison between um, the Vitality Committee and the Chamber of Commerce and be a voice of the local business communities. Are we supposed to keep that from being a dying business? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm Amy Grady, the Economic Vitality Manager. And our folks online, does anyone online want to, or zooming in, want to introduce themselves? Linda Cato, Rob. Uh, sure. I'm Linda Miller. I'm on the planning board and also on the um, MCI. Um, advisory board for the town. So I'm liaison uh, from the planning board for the economic vitality committee. <clears throat> Sorry, um, I couldn't be in person today. Um, I'm Cato. You just might have seen me briefly there as I'm trying to unmute it, driving traffic, <clears throat> traffic, but. Ironically, my family also used to farm uh, next to the barrels out on Nine Acre Corner, um, the Anderson Wheeler Farms. So we'll go back with the barrels way back four or five generations here. Um, and I own uh, an insurance agency in Concord here, uh, McWalter Volunteer, which has been in business since 1907. Um, I'm also on the board with uh, Mark and Greg and Steve uh, and the business partnership and have been on this board or this committee since the beginning um, when Mike and a few others of us came up with an idea to put this together to help the, you know, help new businesses come into Concord and existing businesses, you know, help them thrive in town. So, um, and with Mimi, it's been a great sort of um, <clears throat> partnership working on things. Her and I do a little bit on the marketing stuff together. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. Hey, Alan, everybody. Beth Williams, tourism manager, also a starting board member of this group uh, with Cato and a bunch of others. Um, Stephen Crane appointed me before there was a Mimi to sort of like help out in my role as tourism manager for the town. And I'm a chamber board member and um, I'm the new chair of the board for the Greater Merrimack Valley Convention and Visitor Bureau as well. Ross? Hi, Ross Jacobson. Um, I am newer to town, been here a couple of years now. And similar to Tiffany, I'm, I'm a community board member. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a long family history of farming here, but I am building a history of eating all of our old baked goods. So happy to be part of the community and part of the part of the committee. Great. Okay, thank you all for that. And this is again it's helpful. Um, I think as far as the, the interest, I wanna make sure I cover what you folks are interested in, but I think on the macro level, um, I see you as sort of the, the working group that you know 
there's larger committees, associations, social and information, but you folks may be kind of weighing in on policies, which is helpful, good to know. Um, <clears throat> like to say, I'm here to serve the town of Concord. Um, the town of Concord has many sort of different elements and components. And so, you know, I don't think there has been a place like this to go to sort of share you know, what Public Works does. And good to know, you know, you're here. When it comes to the wastewater uh, dilemma, and Steve is correct, we are at a, a this, this concept of moving to Concord and shutting the door goes back a long time. And it's probably since you've seen newcomers coming and they're, you know, from the, the get-go, I've observed it since I've been here since 80 or 96. But more importantly with the wastewater arena, the challenge with wastewater is um, at least municipal wastewater, the Clean Water Act in the 70s triggered and identified a huge environmental need nationwide. And with that need, uh, there was awareness that we got to do something. We are polluting our rivers, our streams. Um, this is serious. And this was a bipartisan need identified and challenge identified. And they put federal money into trying to address this problem. And this was, you know, back in the 80s, a lot of communities were tasked with identifying, you know, where are you? This is an opportunity to start looking at wastewater treatment at a level that was significantly more advanced than it had been historically, with a lot of state and federal money to the tune of 90% of upgrades and improvements to treatment plants were from state and federal funds. Mm -hmm. They backed their regulations and policies and laws with money. <clears throat> At that time, communities, as of you know, in the uh, 1980s, you know, had sort of their, that became their baseline wastewater planning phase. And regrettably, or whether, you know, fairness, equity, not every community has evolved the same way. Some communities have lost populations, lost businesses, lost large users. Others have been growing steadily. If you're within the MWRA uh, service area, um, more urban areas, you have not had the same challenges. You paid a lot for service. They put Deer Island in, you know, that was a major upgrade for recently, significant money, um, but, it wasn't a capacity constraint, it was more just economics. Communities like Concord, you start getting the 495 belt and out in Western Mass, they are independent, they have their own wastewater systems, including collection systems, pump stations, and treatment facilities. And usually a treatment facility for the town of, town of Concord is not unusual, it's just one facility. Concord is very progressive when it comes to planning. At the same time, the vision thing was kind of lost where, well, if we, if we want to control growth and we don't want to spoil this, this community, let's make sure we don't, if you build it, they will come. That was a mantra back in the 70s, 80s. Basically, what do we need? And let's not design or plan for more than that. At a time where the regulations were new, the uh, requirements to, to get capacity was not onerous, but that set the stage in the late 70s, early 80s for Concord saying, we want a 1.2 million gallon a day facility. We know the general area that it's gonna serve and we can, so it's gonna expand a little bit, but we don't want it to be too large because if we build it, they will come. We've been living with that same planning decision for you know, 40 years and when I came to town in 1996, a facility that had been um, designed and constructed in the uh, mid 80s, um, 10 years into its operation, we had already met a regulatory threshold of when you meet, when you exceed 80% of your design basis for flow, 
you need to do an evaluation to make sure that you're managing and you're not just giving away the farm because you're regulated. And that regulation is EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and DEP. So as soon as I came to Concord, we were hit with this requirement to do this assessment. And at the time, uh, Greg, you may remember, it was an exhaustive process. Okay. It was a two or three year process, 70, 80 meetings, public meetings, neighborhood meetings, to try and understand the needs of the town, understand that we had a limited capacity available, and we were challenged as a town to distribute that capacity fairly and in a manner that was met certain tenets of the community. At that time, the community still of that mantra, we're careful, you know, we want to make sure we're judicious with where it's going to go. At the time, it was more about environmental protection. This was in the you know, uh, early 2000s than it was about economic growth and vitality. This committee didn't exist. One of the problems when we had the stakeholders, it was inclusive of various boards and committees, but prominent were Public Works, NRC, Planning, Board of Health, those were sort of the key players. And at the time, there was a decision that we're going to allocate this very carefully and we're going to focus on existing needs, not so much growth, but how do we accommodate those areas of the town that are, are having significant failures in their Title V inspections? These people are going to be challenged with doing something. In some of these areas, it's not going to be cheap or inexpensive, and it will not provide a lot of environmental protection. We finished that study in 2003, went to town meeting to get it, you know, I can't remember if it was adopted or approved or whatever the term was, but publicly acknowledged. And within a couple of years, all of a sudden, this was, I think, I don't know, the Romney, all of a sudden, the whole idea of planning for housing became a big state initiative. And we had just finished a wastewater plan. Now, if you're going to develop a property and you're on your own, the first thing you need to know is what's the infrastructure that I have and what can it support? Well, we already put some controls in place not to allow for economic growth or plan the, the the PPP plan housing um, plan, I think there's a term for it. But it was almost like we had you know, sort of amnesia that didn't everybody just understand that we've we got this capacity constraint. We revisited the plan, we worked with planning, and in 2007, we kind of realigned some of the, the, uh, the planning considerations, but again, very publicly, made the case that you know, we don't have a lot of capacity available. We know we need more. There was an interest of the town to do what it can to try and expand our capacity. The problem is, as Steve mentioned, the regulatory environment and community is not interested in making that easy or affordable. We have had a number of different developments in the past 20 years, inclusive of evaluating the Grace property where the bus depot is and the solar to explore could we have a large leak? Oh, important. The regulators do not want to see new discharges to streams, rivers. They're not looking to see any of that. In fact, they cap that. They say if you want to expand your wastewater capacity, you have to go to the ground. That's a significant limitation to a small community. A lot of that ground area is a good sands and gravels that were probably developed or to be developed, but they don't, it's a, it's a control. It's a governor on how much capacity we could have. We explored grace, we identified the potential leaching area. This is very preliminary, about 400,000 gallons a day. If we were to build a facility in West Concord, tie in you know, a lot of the centralized, you know, maybe the West Concord area, maybe expand down Main Street, we could possibly shave 400,000 gallons off of our treatment plant to centralize. But it was very early, and there's also the question, it was a, you know, a super fun site. It wasn't particularly desirable, but when you don't have a lot of options, you, you look at what you can. So 
believe it or not, the purchase of that property was started from a brownfield grant that I saw for wastewater. I wasn't a couple of town interested in that property. It was a state, uh, it was the beginning of. It took sort of a course and, and sort of got developed for other purposes. We still have a, a, a flag that someday we could possibly do something to expand over there, but nothing that's gonna happen in the next couple of decades. We then went to the wastewater treatment plant. We explored an option of what if we split the flow from the, the discharge of the river, Concord River, and put some to the old sand beds that are over by the treatment plant. And we did a, a fairly sophisticated model of you know, what could we, what could that receive? And I think we determined it was somewhere around 150,000 gallons a day. It's not a lot, but it's something. Um, but the cost of it was about three and a half million dollars for that 150,000. And because it was not necessarily ideal and we weren't forced to go there yet, we were still managing with our, our permit, we just sort of held off on that. Um, there has been, we have done improvements to the treatment facility around 2007 that allowed us to make a case, which we did to EPA and the EPA to say, we're treating the water to standards. You know, we, we call flow and load, it's kind of important to understand. Flow is the volume of water going through with pollutants in it. The load is the pollutants that you remove. And so we made a case that we're doing such great treatment. If you allow us to increase our flow, we'll maintain the load. We'll, we'll do more treatment and we'll remove the pollutants. And it seemed to be a pretty reasonable argument, one that we actually took to Washington through the environmental appeal boards, you know, with attorneys and, and because we weren't getting the buy-in locally, we got a permit, they wouldn't consider that need. We did a study showing we had, I think 300 to 500,000 gallons of need for the community to realize our economic growth development and housing limitations. We did that analysis. We said, here's our need, here's the proposed solution. And we literally had to appeal our permit, get attorneys to do it, and took it all the way to Washington. And we got some consideration for some of our arguments, but region one, which is you know just New Hampshire and Massachusetts, EPA has control, they have authority, they're delegated authority. We're one of three states in the country where EPA's voice matters. And they would say, no, flow, they consider a pollutant. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, we, we had a really good technical case to be made and the regulators thwarted it. And so we've done a lot of things trying to be creative and we just continue to hit this ceiling of, we can't get approval from the regulators. And I will say Concord is not alone. Um, we're continuing to fight as far as statewide on trying to get creative. We do, we've developed what we call an integrated water um, plan. We're trying to get creative with stormwater management, wastewater, and drinking water. And you probably heard it out in California. That was where some of the early models of this were. To make a case that you want to abide by science, want to make sure the water balance is managed properly. It's a better way of being more efficient with where we're spending money. And we've tried to advance that as a mechanism to try and increase capacity. It's innovative, still nothing. So we've been challenged. We are now at a point where the state and Concord is now no longer, and we're not alone. We might be you know, uh, on the, what I call the bleeding edge of this, but with the MBTA community zoning requirements, um, and the governor's desire to increase affordable housing, this, this problem of communities having finite resources to meet these demands that are now politically you know, desired are starting to you know, hit the pavement. And I just, sir, I just attended a task force meeting two weeks ago that is a group of business developers some regulators, you know, through the governor and through um, Secretary Augustus on housing 
um, hurdles. They're trying to identify what, where are the problems? Where are the, where are the constraints? And I was able to present Concord as an example of you know, your policies say one thing, you want to see this, and the regulations say another. And you guys got to get together and figure out how do places like Concord, not just for economic you know, growth vitality, for planning for housing and the MBTA, we're stuck. So it's important to know that we continue to push, but I think this committee is going to be an important player as we try to get more uh, political and more of the messaging because the director of public works, I do what I can for the state, specifically with Concord's message that is pretty compelling. And it's remarkable the knowledge and understanding but the lack of they're not doing anything yet. And so right now, where does that put Concord? Well, we have a couple things that are kind of fortuitous. One is the MCI closure was never, well, I will tell you this, 25 years ago, we met with MCI team to talk about a partnership at their wastewater treatment plant 25 years ago. At the time, we were dismissed and, you know, thanks, you know, don't call again, pretty much. I think you weren't at that meeting, but anyway. Yeah. Two years ago, we saw the, the, um, the flows and we saw the, the uh, headcount at MCI dropping. So we figured maybe we can sort of reopen this conversation. And we reached out, had a meeting, we decided we were going to um, apply for a grant to do an evaluation because we knew the capacity issues. We wanted to re-explore what our options might be, considering a partnership with MCI. This is well before anybody in MCI had any clue, anybody knew what was going to happen. So we kind of started this discussion, and lo and behold, what you see is the, the, uh, the governor's budget provided sort of with the closure of MCI this opportunity for Concord to potentially take over that facility. And so right now we are earnestly looking at, could there be a benefit for the town to take over that facility and not just for the redevelopment of that parcel, which would be important. But what's important is they have a surface water discharge permit. That's gold. They have a facility with a permit. And we're trying to figure out what or how could we leverage that to the benefit of what the governor wants to see with redevelopment, potentially parlay that into, well, what do we need potentially for West Concord? And is there a way to get creative to try and now have two facilities? What's this facility? What's this? It's 300,000 gallons, which isn't a lot, but it's something. But when you look at 300,000 there and 1.2 here, and you start looking at engineering opportunities, there's actually some potential benefit that might be more than 1.2 plus 3 being 1.5. We might be able to figure out a way to get a little bit more creative with that. We're looking at that. We've spent some money recently um, on evaluating the facilities and what the condition, and, and Giovanni can tell you, the way the state operates is they kind of wait for it to break before it's an emergency, before they invest. They don't do a lot of preventative maintenance. So there are a lot of needs, but that discussion is going on. It's real time. We have also re-engaged our consultant who did the original comprehensive wastewater master plan 25 years ago, or it's really 20, 21 years ago, to come back and kind of recalibrate our plan with what we see today and basically start, it's not from scratch. We have a lot of the baseline information, but what exists today that we should be looking at as far as alternatives, needs, maybe reprioritizing. We have two problems. One is we are presently exceeding our capacity, exceeding. 
We've done that in the past for a month or two, but this past spring, we exceeded it from March through June, July. Currently, currently we're still exceeding. We may get a knock on the door saying, you got a problem, Conquer. The biggest problem we would have is do not connect anything new until you solve this, a forced moratorium. We could have that. We would have to try and figure out what's our what's our pushback. What do we do? This committee voice will be will be asking for you know help us so that we don't get a moratorium. Um, we think we're not alone, but we don't know that. Other systems of our size and capacity may be challenged because of weather conditions that have been pretty. Um, pretty wet seasons that we've had, and but we we aren't in control once EPA comes knocking. Um, but we do have a consultant on board to help us navigate the what ifs, and we have the MCI, which is a really an interesting, unique opportunity that's very time sensitive um, that we will be you know exploring. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of political will and interest to see. Something succeed over there and conquer to the center of it. So we'd be looking at trying to parlay that interest into, you know, we want to we want to work together. So anyway, that's sort of a that's the overview. And I'm the messenger. It's not the greatest message, but what I'm here to do is just help you understand what the situation is. And I'm also not a magician. And you know, so you know, I'm just here to kind of tell you what we have, what we're what we're doing, what we've done, and you know, so I'll open it up to you know. Is there any way of estimating? I'm thinking, if the MCI plant is run sort of the way the bridges were run by the state, yeah, deteriorating to the point where we don't want to buy it, yeah, would we be able? I wonder if we would be able to get. Their the large share of their capacity shifted to our plant, which I think is in better condition, mm -hmm. and treat it treat it there. Like take their three hundred gallons and move it. Leave fifty thousand gallons, whatever. Yeah, so for, for so the neighborhood, Greg, it's not. It's a. It's an. It's it's a very insightful question that we're already having. Again, it's getting creative and. We need that, you know, we're thinking along those sorts of lines, but even more than that. But we that's what we need to do. I mean, the way the regulations are developed, you got to get incredibly creative. You got to have political will, because if it's just EPA at the table, they don't want a precedent that's going to sort of blow out their controls. And, and I'll tell you what, they listen to the Conservation Law Foundation. They listen to... Suasco watershed, Charles River watershed. These are groups that aren't interested in seeing development. I mean, that's not their thing. Their thing is to present the, the preserve that. And we're the ones that have to try and figure out, okay, well, how do we do the practical things? And it's not a knock on, it's just they are advocates and that's what they do very effectively. Is there a limitation on expansion of the uh, total beds? Over there, any place. Yeah, so interesting to say they have filter beds over at MCI that are, have been abandoned. We have our filter beds that have been abandoned. That's part of the engineering and permitting things we we want to explore, and will. So, um, is the no growth philosophy still in place? And if so, you know so. Part of this committee's role is to recommend the select board and to maybe, you know, the commission, yeah. you know, the need to update that philosophy to say that, you know, it, there needs to be some growth. And in fact, you know, so one of the real reality checks for this group is, you know, when you think about really servicing the town and bringing more businesses to the town, I think of restaurants. You think of high water uses, mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately, you know, as landlords, brokers, 
everyone, you know, right out of their mouth, mouth comes, you know, sewer improvement fee, sewer capacity issues. So I'm wondering what do we need to do to sort of make it clear to yourself and to the select board that, you know, we believe strongly in some sort of, you know, modest growth. And we'd like to have it dedicated to commercial purposes, you know, for the following, you yeah. know, solid reasons. Yeah. So let me explain. And yes, so this process, we're going to be revisiting the plan. You know, I knew in Canada, know you're here, but you're a stakeholder, which will help that voice get at the table. You know, when you say me, you don't have to convince me of anything. I'm only here to orchestrate. When I say I serve Concord, it's everybody. It's the single family homes, it's the affordable housing, it's the business. The reality is, I think the opportunity is as we go through and reimagine where wastewater should be prioritized, we now have you know, sort of your voice will be represented and you need to make sure it is represented. Understand the following, and this is the facts. If we're looking at, if we looked at the uh, wastewater treatment plant over at uh, MCI, understand they're still using it for the farm across the way. They're still they're using about 60,000 gallons a day, which isn't, isn't going away. And there's going to be a portion that's going to have to uh, accommodate the development, whatever that may be on that parcel. We did, aside from that, we're looking at this is the cost, and it's not just because about $25 million to upgrade, replace that facility. $25 million. 300,000 gallons. All of that would be considered new use. If we did the simple math, and you don't want to burden the rate payer, because they're only a third of the town, right? They don't, they're not supporting the entire, not the whole town, the sewers and enterprise. So it's only the rate payers that are sort of covering the cost of service. It's $80 per gallon, Title V. So I was talking to the director in Maynard recently, who is there hungry to get they have facilities, they want people to come in. They don't have water. He's literally telling me, he says, it's not how much that I don't have it. I wish I had a price to give because that at least I can move forward. We're kind of in that situation with our wastewater. So there is really no capacity other than the dribbles and drabs that we can accommodate right now. And we're in a different situation now than we were this time last year. And I've always told people, we have to do what we can to control sort of expansion, because at some point we're going to, if we don't have a relief valve, and we really don't, we may have, one could argue, if we needed to proceed with the 150,000 gallons over the wastewater treatment plant, because we can, we'd have to, we'd have a consent order. So we now have the, the regulator saying, okay, give us your schedule. How are you and when are you going to achieve this? And how are you going to manage that 150,000 gallons of demand? And we're going to have to go back to, well, the plan identifies more than that, less than that. We're going to have to make that plan fit that need. But the reality is, it's we need a, a, an alternative solution. To, 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 we need that plan, we need the relief valve, but we don't have that right well, now. We're at high risk. Is that, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, you, you said the prison has a permit for surface discharge. Does that uh, fill a bit, consider that? Steve, oh, that's oh. what we're looking at to try and understand. No, the surface, the, the filter bit, just like Concord, you did so much, they improved their facility enough where they didn't need the polishing with the filter bed, so they abandoned it just like we did over uh, at our uh, facility. Um, but now a permit for groundwater is a state permit, not a federal permit, which is interesting. And that's why we're looking at those to figure out, is there some way we can work that to be the advantage so we can accommodate the, the redevelopment 
that the governor wants, the affordable housing and housing production the governor wants. Well, what is that? Is it like a regular septic system with treated water going into treated it? Treated water that goes into it. The difference is, and I'm just, you'll get it. There's phosphorus and nitrogen, depending on your receiving waters. Groundwater, you have to worry about nitrogen, surface water, and phosphorus. So there's ways of, it's the engineering opportunities we're looking at, trying to figure out how best to leverage that. Is it better to do phosphorus reduction in one facility and nitrogen reduction in the other? Because it's the, the headworks, all the treatment and chemicals and costs are not discharging to the ground or the, the, the stream, it's the process to get it there. So we could use water with nitrogen and phosphorus on crops. Or that's a, a reuse, right, right. And, you know, and those are some of the things with integrated planning that you, you talk about. And in California, they do reuse. I mean, reuse in California is wastewater goes to drinking water. Everything else. Yeah. And, you know, we may get there. We may have to get there. Yeah. When you say regulators, yeah. and then you say DEP, and then you say yeah. EPA, and then you say state. Okay. Are they unique? Or when you say regulators, are you talking EPA or are you talking DEP? Or when I say regulators, I mean both EPA and DEP both issue their own permits, which is and why what's the origin of the fact that the EPA has regulations on Massachusetts and not on Arkansas? What's the Arkansas? You go through a process of delegated authority saying we're going to own this program. We know the Clean Water Act. We're going to administer, manage it, and um, who says it? The state has to. This would be DEP. No, but why is the EP? You said something it's, about New Hampshire, Massachusetts. Some of it's like the states are EPA. Yeah. Why? Why? Because the states have not accepted delegated authority to own the permit. I, I sat on a task force probably 10 years ago to say, why are we doing it this way? And here's a problem. I'm just telling you, I, I will tell the regulators, their EPA, EPA has their thumb on our, you know, uh, our scale because the state doesn't want or won't accept that delegation, which means yeah. they can test things out here that they can't elsewhere, which is remarkable. Yeah, and like and the opposite is in California, where California does move forward and say we will interpret the EPA's guidelines on our own, and that's why they can regulate emission vehicle standards in ways that other states can. But it also lands in court a lot when a state decides that they're going to interpret interpret EPA. But if there's there are fifty like states a, and yeah. only three well, in Massachusetts. I mean, no, but I mean that's forty-seven. Yeah. are are Delegated assuming the responsibility. Correct. For permitting, correct. Uh, you, that isn't to say that if we took that responsibility, oh, we're we're cool. We can go twenty five million. No, yeah. but we wouldn't be looking at EPA's interpretation of. I, I understand, that, that, but we could have regulators. It, it, it isn't nirvana to have your your state. It isn't perfect <laughs> that it's going to automatically make it easy. No, the barn doors don't fly open, but it's a lot less challenging. So how much effort are we putting into as stakeholders of people like you that have to figure out how to... There, there was a task force about 10 years ago. But to we're, we're, well, is that something we'd have to go to the legislature and, yeah. have, yeah, to, and have the like, governor yeah, yeah, yeah. This would be a lot yeah. of yeah. one Yeah. Well, I, but that's fine and dandy compared to... 25 million to get some filter beds. Right. Well, I mean, that, would, that would affect the entire state. And I understand. I understand. And well, my point is, it that. sounds like it would be, you know, spend a nickel to get a, to get a dollar if you could convince the state to accept the responsibility of a permit. But it goes back to the Clean Water Act. It goes right? back to the Clean and, Water Act. Yeah, That's the like driver. It to the Clean Water and, Act. And there's something in a term, and I'm just, again, sharing stuff. This yeah. is really into the weeds. Yeah. But there's a term called anti-degradation. It's in the Clean Water Act. 
written by people who knew what it meant at the time and no one else had a clue. But basically it says, if you want to increase your flow, you have to demonstrate that that will not have a, it won't cause anti-degradation in that water body. Makes sense. And now when we attempted to increase flow, we got hit by local environmental groups to say, well, you are not regulated pharmaceuticals, but if you're going to expand flow, we want you to do studies to demonstrate what the impact of pharmaceuticals may be. It becomes this rat's nest of gamesmanship that you just keep walking into and they just keep playing games with it. And it's it's infuriating because yeah. it's it's politics more than science. And that's not happening yeah. in Tennessee. No, flow is, flow is you know, when we went to the EAD, flow is not a pollutant everywhere. The other states do not have that control because they are interpreting it, not EPA. But so I think are, that's in sort of messy areas when some states decide to have correct. very, you know, lax interpretations and like, oh, yeah, maybe maybe responsible. I don't know what it, it is depends. because look where I mean, we are. I would like maybe that's like the last I'm one. I'm sorry, I, 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 I would call it. Like, yeah, I, no, I feel you and I want to like keep it going. It really is an opportunity. And, and I am out there advocating, you know, the funny thing is I'm active out there to say these things because not a lot of water suppliers, wastewater directors do. There's not a lot of people, but we're really stymied. Right. And it's not, you know, I serve a community that is has expectations and it's very frustrating when you just keep hitting yeah, the wall. Like ping -ponging back yeah. and forth. That's not so um are you identifying sort of all spots in town that could be used for whatever you want? Yeah, like, groundwater discharge yeah. would be it. So yeah, you, yeah. Have, you have that sort of map. Right we there. did that, yeah. Uh, and because one of the things that I've impressed a little bit is to, for us to be doing the same on the commercial side. So, for mm -hmm. example, there's a, an industrial park and, you know, it would have been great. I would have thought it would have been great to have, um, you know, like a brewery. However, there was this issue of, well, you're in the industrial park and if you start selling T-shirts, that bounces you out of that use. And so... We're trying to do an analysis to say, all right, let's look at the regulations as to, you know, what those policies are, and then conform those in the all in the effort to, you know, bring business to Concord. Yeah. And, you know, so, but I think it's important that, you know, we're able to sort of identify, right, here are the opportunities, and on the, on the sewer side, if I can call it that, um, here are the opportunities and here's the cost. Mm -hmm. I think that would be super helpful to have that. That's what we'll be looking at because it's now 21 years later to put it on the table. So these are the facts. And I said the one thing that's the silver lining is MCI came out of nowhere and it really opened up a potential opportunity. And we're just at the beginning of exploring that. And Knowing that you're here and Mimi is, you know, involved with MCI and sort of tracking, you know, developments. And my interest is to make sure that I'm sharing the right information with the right people to get the right result. And I'm not driving it. You know, it's, it's the community needs to have these these understandings. Um, and and I appreciate hard questions because if we haven't thought of something, we want to think about it. But it's really it, what you described, Mark. It's the bar to change locally is significantly less high than it is to change the, the federal bar. You know, and that's what's so I think those things that you're looking at, that would be through you know planning and zoning. And I don't know, I don't know the mechanics of that, but at least that is something which I think you know it should be advanced. And even when we talk about um over at uh, MCI, there's gonna be an opportunity, and I would plug into that. Creative zoning, I mean, creative in the right way, could open the door to concepts that you're thinking about that at least you could sort of get into the discussion. And if you can set a model that, oh, that's not so bad, and then that can kind of translate to other areas, it's, it's it might be a good opportunity. The concern is somewhat simple, and that is, you know, we all drove by Serafina for 10 years. Mm -hmm. We said, wow, I used, to, I used to really like going there. I wonder why it's dark. Well, part of the reason why it was dark 
this is the store improvement fees, seats, what have you. But Joe Public doesn't know that. They don't know the magnitude of the store improvement fee. They don't know conversations between the brokers and potential people who want to go in. Mm -hmm. So it's really just sort of educational. Mm -hmm. And there's also this sort of residential commercial sort of balance that's becoming out of balance, right? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so you know, residential used to be 90%. Now it's picked up to like 96. Pretty soon, you know, we, if we don't have the capacity for businesses, it will just sort of stagnate. And if it doesn't grow, it's going to, you know, sort of deteriorate. And so I think we're trying to proactively keep it robust and bring more business. And by the way, through uh, MBTA, through, you know, more Healy's uh, sort of focus on, we're going to need more businesses to support mm -hmm. a larger community. Because actually, the policy doesn't meet the regulations, right? But I'm not. I don't think. Our, I'm not sure our town policy. But that's meets the what we're doing. saying that's here. Right. So I think part of our job, you know, is to make recommendations that make it clear that if the current policy says no growth, we actually don't agree with that, and we sort of agree with focused growth in these areas. And here's why. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. Here's sort of our and redistribute. Thoughts. If you're going to do something as of 2024. What's the town's priorities? It's different than it was in 2003. I know that. I think I do have to stop the discussion here. Well, though it's lively. And you know where I am. <laughs> and I, maybe you can come in and talk. But more importantly, knowing that you're sort of here. Yeah. I mean, and I work closely with Mimi. So you're, she's your ear and, you know, voice. And it's not lost on us. But I, I appreciate the fact that this, this entity committee didn't exist before, and I don't think it was as well represented as it could have been. I'm not sure who would have been that voice at the time, but, you know, but but that, NRC. I, that was the core problem that we were trying to address. That's right. I, I wonder whether it would be helpful, this is to me, I wonder whether it would be helpful to have this discussion. I, are we being taken? Yes. I, I don't know whether this is a good enough take <laughs> with Mark and I involved, yeah, sure I'm sure But no, what I mean is, is to put it on the web, town website, highlighted somehow that that people can be directed to a discussion like this to sort of get the background of what the problem is. So it isn't like Alan Cathcart's jerk and won't give us any capacity. I take it the the <laughs> two may be related. But they're not really <laughs> But it would be interesting to he I mean to, to find out that Massachusetts doesn't want to sign on to regulate itself in the Clean Waters Act, ergo it leads it to the EPA, is kind of an eye-opening little bit of piece of information. You know what I would appreciate, Greg? This group needs to talk with other groups in those other communities because it's not public works people. I right. They're my master. They're not your master. Right, right. And that's the group that needs to put pressure to the governor and to the commissioner, the DEP, to go, this isn't working. I will tell you that housing task force is kind of doing that. That's their role. So I should, you know, I'll talk to Mimi so she can maybe track and monitor what's going on. But they've been tasked to come up with trying to find um um, what was it? Unlocking some of the regulatory policy, just like we were doing locally. This housing group is supposed to be doing that statewide. Mm -hmm. And I made it very clear that this issue that we're talking about in Concord mm -hmm. is not only Concord. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 a, it's a big discussion, but we're like oh, half of yeah. <laughs> 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 the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just want to put out. So I'm just saying, I'm wondering if, because Mike's going to ask us to do something. I think at, at the end yeah. of the day, we're going to send him bullets or a letter, what have you. Then I'm wondering maybe if we somehow hook in, think of like almost a media campaign, maybe it starts with a bridge, to start getting the the issue out there so that the public is informed. Yeah. I, I think that would I've definitely supportive of that because you know, I hear what you're saying, as you can imagine, the environmental groups that we have locally and more broadly will also have a lot to say on this. Oh, yeah. We want to put you know, it to the it, part. It's yeah. legitimate. Yes. They do it for a living. We do it as we're trying to do the day job. Mm -hmm. The advocacy side. Is there any effort to uh, put private systems in, in new construction any place that's possible? Yes. Yeah. That's that was one of the tenets of the plan. Is if you're outside this area, 
you you have to do on site. Yeah, you know, that's sort of the a lot of new construction yeah. is on site. Yeah, and you you know, Steve, are a great example of a, 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 a water intensive use that has to have your own. It's it's a challenge. It takes a lot of land, a lot of management. Expensive. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's all expensive. Right, I know. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, this no, was no, good. Thank you for, uh, yeah. yeah, I think we'll all be we'll have an open we'll dialogue. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot to you know. Talk. We know where to find each other. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Someone has to listen, take notes. Okay. Keep learning. <laughs> well, I, I just like to add what you said about Serafina. You know, on the um, I've been tasked with processing the SIF myself. So I, I worked at MCI Concord Accounts set for 10 years. So I was a very good customer of both Chang and <laughs> um, when they closed. And I drive through there because I live in Sudbury, the next town over. I said, well, my favorite restaurant is closed. But I would say, Bandolero. And we all helped out to. I, I was very happy in trying to help the owner, the the, uh, the business owner there, and he, you know, wasn't fluent, and we helped him because it, we want business, we want to bring business. Chang and close, I think he's looking at another location there, so we're welcoming. Is you know, it's just you got to balance the capacity yeah. with economic mm growth, -hmm. and it's not an easy balance. Absolutely. Sometimes we look at the the bad guys in the picture, but we're we're looking at the EP and EPA, you know, regulations every day. Good. I'm a bad guy. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> good yeah. Very nice to meet you all. Beth, if you're still with us, it looks like you are. Did you want to give us your update? Sure. Yeah. Hi, I'm here. Um. I actually thought that was fascinating and a lot more than I've ever heard in my five years being here. So um, <laughs> I think the transparency part is amazing. Like to, And I, I, I like the idea of putting some of that online because I do think to Mark's point, Joe Schmo doesn't know that. Like people yeah. have no idea what has gone into it and what the town departments have actually done to fight for expansion and, and, and changes to those regulations. So that's my two cents. Um, my tourism update is... Um, Effective September 3rd, the North Bridge is inaccessible to pedestrian vehicular everybody. The North Bridge will be essentially closed down. They, the last phase of the Great American Outdoors Act that the national parks received their grant funding for um, is to fix the LA, uh, which is the area between Monument Street and the bridge and between Liberty Streets, uh, the visitor center at Liberty Street and the other side of the bridge. Um, so it's approximately an eight week closure um, access to the bridge will be only via the overlook at the Buttrick Mansion. There will be half the parking spots in the Liberty Street ride will be unavailable, including bus parking. And yes, it is fall foliage season. So um, that is creating a lot of anxiety <laughs> in my world. Um, the National Park is doing a great job getting word out. Um, I've sent word out. The chamber has helped me spread the word. Um, our tourism huddle has been meeting about it. Um, the biggest thing is to just uh, be informed. Um, the park service hopefully will have rangers there starting on Tuesday to help direct the buses. Um, this really sort of comes back to the fact that a lot of the buses don't communicate with me as a tourism manager. So they are not getting the information from me on bathrooms open, closed, parking lots. So I do expect there'll be a flurry of activity and um, probably some severe disappointment for some of those groups that like to see the bridge. Um, mm -hmm. But it's going to be amazing to have it done. I think the plan for doing it, you know, while hopefully it takes eight weeks or less, it's going to make for a much better spring. It's going to help alleviate some of the flooding um, and really prepare the bridge itself and the area surrounding it for the 250th when they expect obviously significantly more um, visitors. Um, but that's the biggest thing I'm working on right now since that is imminent um, and going to have a big effect on our fall tourism season, which it can be our biggest. Um, I will say we've had our biggest August on record, um, which just for record, it's only five years since I started keeping them. <laughs> um, but that goes back to pre-COVID records. So um, it continues to be a really hot, popular tourist destination. And, you know, 
that impacts the sewer and the rainwater and all of that other stuff. So um, it really is all one big town um, has to work together for all of those reasons. But um, that's the biggest thing for me for for the next couple of weeks is is how we how we showcase the bridge in other ways. Um, so our tours are running a brand new tour called North Bridge and Beyond, which will take people to the visitor center, to the Overlook, um, walking up Monument Street. So you will be able to get some glimpses of it. Um, and we're working with some other creative programming and the Minuteman Visitor Center is expanding their visitor hours. Um, so they will be open. They've been open only three days a week right now. Um, they're expanding access and they are making really good progress on the rest of the Battle Road trails. So there's more and more of those open to try to hopefully mitigate some of the impact. There'll be some other places the buses can go. Um, and that, that that's the big one <laughs> for me. Well, thank you. That is uh, certainly very big. Um, I commend you and everyone else for coming up with those creative solutions and agree that getting it all prepped for the 250th is the, the big product, consolation prize there. So. For sure. um, I hope I hope you get through the next few weeks. Okay. Thank you. The Rude Bridge that parks a flood <laughs> is going to be flood proof, <laughs> isn't it? No, I did say it was an opportunity for our friends at the South Bridge Boathouse because the only way you'll be able to get up close to the bridge is in a kayak. I understand, but that's pretty historically the case. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> to me, yes. it's like well, we're going to flood. Walt Disney World. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you again, uh, Amy. Did you want to give your update? Yes, uh, there's going to be a hearing for Concord MCI with DCAM, that's the Department of Capital Asset Management and Maintenance. Um, so this is sort of a preliminary listening session, kind of get the beat of the community and kind of an overview. It's going to be here on September 12th. There'll be a hybrid meeting. We're expecting it to be pretty crowded. So mm -hmm. Um, if we folks are able to log in, all the better. Um, as promised, I got the uh, new business website is now live on the town website. So I invite folks to check that out. It's um, on the homepage. Um, and then you also can get it through the directory. Um, if folks have got feedback, please send it along, especially in writing, because then I can compile it all together and, and make edits along the way. Um, the uh, public art installation is moving forward. So that is the um, artist benches that we got the grant from the New England Foundation for the Arts. Um, the iron pour for casting is happening this weekend. Um, and then we'll be putting out the um, first PR is going out uh, end of this week and then early next week. So we're doing a uh, writer's workshop with uh, Kate McQuaid, who's one of the big arts reporters for the Globe is a day long. So we'll be calling um, invitation for people to participate in that. Um, and then we've got five, or sorry, four events, a uh, concert on October 5th, a pub, oh, this is in October, the Wright Tavern Pub Choir is gonna be on October 20th. The Robbins House is doing some drop-in art making. Um, and then once the artwork is in place, there's gonna be a, a film, like a, these mini movies kind of shot there um, and for kind of fostering the conversations about Concord history and how it's relevant for today. Um, so that'll all be rolling out shortly. Um, uh, Zach, who is my summer intern, um, wrapped up his work a little earlier. Um, so when he said he was going to stay till the end of August, I really didn't believe him, and that was true. Um, but we, we did finish draft of the study. Um, so right now I'm kind of bedding it through internal staff to make sure we got our facts right. Um, I'm planning on right after the Ag Day to send it to the Ag Committee to get their review um, and we'll bring it to this committee and then hoping to put it out to the community, sort of like how the Recreation Department with their plan put it out there for comment before it's kind of officially endowed. And that study was really looking at recognizing that Concord's got very limited land that's zoned specifically for commercial. Over 60% of the town is protected open space. Mm -hmm. And we're recognizing that that open space isn't necessarily closed for business. That we recognize that there's farm, active farms, there's some uh, recreation businesses. So we're looking at specifically farms and businesses, uh, what are the things that they need? Recognizing a lot of them are actually controlled by town policy and mm -hmm. are, are those policies helping or hindering? Um, and just sort of understanding how is climate change affecting them? Mm -hmm. um, turns out there's a little bit of ARPA money 
that is being tossed my way or potentially tossed my way. So I just um, sent to the town manager a plan to look at a um, food safety program. Um, so it's being vetted. So the idea is recognizing the 250 coming up. I've got this sort of theme about how supports the farm stands, recognizing those as businesses. And a lot of them, um, you know, they're not the most profit driven, they're seasonal. It's hard to invest in that sort of infrastructure. Um, so it looks like there might be 65,000. So I'm looking at a, a, a kind of strategic approach that would be a combination of just building capacity overall. So it would be trainings in food manager safety, tip certification, CPR and choke safe, that a lot of times if you're having a venue serving food, you need to have those certifications. And so if the scout house, if the church social clubs are wanting to open themselves, they need to have somebody on site with those certifications. A lot of times they don't. So we're gonna do the training for free, the certifications for free, and then do a grant program uh, that would be reimbursement for those places to get some of the equipment that they need. So I'm looking at grants of like 5,000, it would be things like fridges, freezers, that you can't just do a home fridge to, to use as a higher grade. Um, and then some giveaways that a lot of times folks aren't using the right thermometers. And I can understand there are a hundred bucks a pop that this grant would supply for them. Um, so I'm working with the food safety folks on that. And I'm not sure if I mentioned the bench grants that I got. Um, we're basically trying to look at how can we keep vehicles off the road for the 250th? And how can we just encourage people? We can't make more parking, but we can get more people to use public transit and to like walk a little bit further. Um, so this is a, a grant through the Mass Department of Office, uh, Mass Office of Travel and Tourism to basically put benches that would make it easier and encourage people to walk from Thoreau Depot, hang out in Concord Center and go to the North Bridge and back. So you park your car and then people go to stores if they're on foot. So we're trying to foster that. Um, so I'm going to be working with my colleagues on the style of benches, exactly where they're going to be. Um, and then uh, next week, I'm going to be doing a presentation of the Concord Business Partnership, sort of like updating them on my first year here. Um, and I will share the notes of that with this community. Thank you. Thank you so much. Got a lot of fun stuff coming up. Um, is there an opportunity to work with the high school in that mentor group to get you an intern or something tantamount to an intern for a school year or the spring, however they're in that semester? Do you think that would be valuable? But, I think it'd be a great experience yeah. for high school senior to be able to work, to attend these meetings, to do work directly with you. I think it'd be a fabulous opportunity. Yeah, I haven't connected with the high school program so far, so yeah, please make an introduction. We should have John Foster at the, at the meeting. John will be there at, at, at the partnership meeting. Mm -hmm. John is like one of the granddaddies of the high school program. Mm -hmm. And he recruits, tries to get people to recruit businesses and people like you to, for kids to work with because they've got plenty of kids that are not in the fab industry. Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's a bit, I'm discovering there's a little bit of a learning curve because of town regulations in terms of interns, employees, kind of thing. So I, I'm not sure, I, I suspect I'm not the first person that's done it here in town. So we can't. Oh, just whip. Just whip. <laughs> Okay, so now we will go to our committee updates. Do we have any updates from our communications marketing group? You did announce that the website is live, and I think that was a major initiative that that group was helping with, Cato. I guess, um, yeah, that was the big thing. And actually Mimi sent me a list of uh, sort of all the copy that goes on behind it. So there's a lot of stuff there that I reviewed earlier this week. So um, she's, it, it's looking really good. Um, and a lot of the stuff that we talked about over the years is on there. So it's great. And now that, it, now that it's right on the front of the website, it was awesome too. They really get one of those buttons. We got a button. <laughs> we got a button. <laughs> and are you able to track metrics on that? Will you be able to see how many visits or yeah, yeah, the the uh, Civic Plus does that. The the town website doesn't get all tons exactly. Of yeah. So I'm trying to really you'll see on the pages push people to sign up for the email newsletter mm -hmm. because I, I get really active because I can see exactly what links people click yeah. on. Um, and then it's the I'm. Yeah, you know, people don't always look at the website, so I could just kind of feed them in. Yeah, that's always been my experience with that kind of work too. It's just indirect traffic. That you it would be good if your news, maybe that your newsletter always had an active link, so people 
so we can get people to use the website. Yeah. Not just for us, but for all the purposes that that website could be advantageous. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Ross is no, thank you so much, Kato. Appreciate that. Um, I haven't checked out the portal yet, so I'm excited to do that. On the recruitment and retention front, as you know, um, Ross Jacobson and I, with the guidance of Mimi, thankfully, and Marie, um, have worked on a draft survey. And I have copies here that I'm happy to give out or hold off to the next meeting just because I felt like we should go through it as a committee and really discuss it versus everyone taking it and just kind of leaving from it. So I think what I'll recommend is for our next meeting that be a pulled out agenda item so we have some time to workshop that together and just sort of discuss the mechanics, the distribution of it, the goals of it. Much of that is done, um, but Mimi has really great feedback and I think we should discuss some of that. So um, that's going to be my update there. So I look forward to September. Um, do we have any updates from the policy and regulation front? Well, I do. I feel that there are some uh, inequities in the store fees that I wanted to yeah. get into, but there wasn't room to do it to the program today. Yeah. That was my hope. Yeah, I think we might need to maybe look at the next meeting if possible. I yeah. recommend this to Mike, that it really is the committee's now talking at length about some of the work that we've been driving because we do run out of time it seems because of the many presentations well we maybe did a bunch of great work that i think is sort of in process yeah and i think um you know we can uh, synthesize that and maybe have that yeah uh, discussion points um and, and you know there's no mystery that it looks you know if you look at the dpw committee or commission mm -hmm. charter it hasn't been revised since 1982. Oh, wow. So it's like 42 <laughs> years ago. The philosophy of uh, no growth appears to be yeah. Yeah. alive and well. Um, you know, I think, you know, we, we maybe did a, uh, a, a little bit of a fair amount of analysis as to the fact that the large store improvement fees are being borne by the business. Mm -hmm. uh, store improvement fees have escalated dramatically in the last 10 years, I think. Um, so I, I think there are a number of talking points that all lead to, I think, the conclusion that it's going to be coming upon this committee to really uh, advocate for and to lobby the select board to start prioritizing um, maybe some changes in the way we think about, number one, you know, there there needs to be some planned growth mm -hmm. and number two there needs to be some relief or accommodation as far as these large we want to say large we're talking you know 75 100 150 200 thousand dollars to improve the fees so the, the numbers are huge yeah um and we still I think there's some still some digging as far as getting connection to the information and really being uh, transparent to the business community when you open a new building in Concord and you need to connect with those fees look like, or when you uh, renovate a store, change a use, mm -hmm. what those fees look look like. So I think we're heading in the right direction. We're not there yet for sure, but um, I mean to put this in perspective, I would say if you go, if you go back the last five years. This is a top three issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a huge issue. I'm afraid I have to leave. I Thank you so much. On a tight schedule. <laughs> um, do we have a Conquer 250 update or are we? Um, I, maybe, um, I can. Yeah. Um, so briefly for the 250, um, there was a new set of grants that the Mass Office of Travel and Tourism put out for the 250th. Um, and Rob and Roe and I, uh, Rob being co-chair of the 250 Executive Committee, um, he and I submitted that grant last week for just over $40,000 that um, it was an extremely tight deadline. Uh, Mott was very, very late, um, gave us very little notice. So thankfully, our committee, the subcommittees for the 250 had been doing a lot of dreaming um, and had a lot of projects that were really ready to go. Um, just waiting on funding. So we applied for three distinct uses. Uh, the first is to expand our Patriots of Color walking tour that we partner with with the Robbins House. And that would create a video um, with a speaker series um, as a history of the 
patriots of color and people of color that fought during those early battles that were often not recognized, as well as expand the walking tour that we offer. Uh, the second initiative is a program called Hoverly, which is augmented reality. And that is partnering with Concord Academy students that have been using it on their property for a couple of years now. And it would expand that to um, cover most of the witness properties in Concord. Um, so what Hoverly does is it's kind of unique. It's a green screen background. So essentially you can record it at MMTV. They would help us do the recording um, and you can take your phone and look as if you're in the place as it was 1775. So it creates this image when you're standing in the location. It is not cell reliant, which is a big thing. We all know that we, we cannot rely on the cell service. Um, a lot of it's downloadable copy content. It can be tracked, um, which is another big thing for Mott is to have those metrics. And the third component is an art exhibition that Concord Art Association has been wanting to try. Um, so those three things together combined for about $40,000. Um, and the word is we will get notified in mid-September. And um, all of those projects are, we very carefully put them under the procurement threshold so that we would have less of a waiting time. We don't need to go out for some big contracts. So because they all have to be engaged by April and spent 100% by June. So it does give us a really tight turnaround. So that was really exciting to do. Um, and then the transportation um, is the other thing keeping me and most people up at night um, for that weekend. So we're working really closely with Brian Goldman from the police, um, the agency that we hired to do events, um, and John Arena for our internal buses for the school department. To uh, We have a master list of parking lots identified, how many spots they can hold, um, and we're really trying to separate usage by what the tourists will need and then also look at what our own residents, employees, employers will need. Um, so that uh, we're working with our GIS. Thankfully, the town has a fantastic GIS team. Um, and we have this intermunicipal agreement that is reviewing those plans. And um, Gail is handling our procurement. So we will be very shortly going out for vehicles um, to handle that map and figure out. And that will only be, it'll be for like a a 22 hour period for when the most of the events will be. So it'll start at like four in the morning before the Lexing Lexington Dawn event um, and go through the proposed drone show at the end of Patriots Day. Um, so things are moving a little bit slower always than we hope for, but those are sort of the two big 250 impacts for this community. Great, thank you so much. Um, the final item we have is a it says possible MCI committee liaison. I don't. I'm not familiar with what that is. So the idea was we want. Did we want to appoint a specific person from this committee to sit in on those meetings as a guest, sort of similar to how Linda Miller sits in on the mm -hmm. planning gotcha. board and, and Mike sits in on them with them. Maybe we can wait. Yeah, for let's stuff. maybe like. See, yeah. maybe we squizzled it. We're, we no longer have a quorum. Yeah, yeah. I think like we probably just need to go to adjournment. So if I can have a motion to oh, adjourn. Adjourn. <laughs> Is there any for the oh. public, public comment? Any public comment yet? No, I think it's all of us. That was voted to adjourn. Okay. Now, this is my profit vote. All in favor? No. Anyone opposed? Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone.